Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today's case has not had a lot of media coverage, even though it involves the tragic story of not just one, but four little girls. They all lived in the same house and went through similar experiences, but we'll be focusing on the youngest victim, Portia Bennett, here today. Portia was just three years old when her life ended by the very people who were supposed to be taking care of her. It's just another tragic and horrible case that could have been avoided if the right people had just been paying attention. But first, let's talk about today's sponsor, Scentbird. Thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. If you are not familiar with who Scentbird is, they are an amazing perfume subscription. Looking for a gift that keeps giving your round? consider giving your friends and family a Scentbird subscription. They have options of three months, six months, or a full year subscription that can be sent directly to the person that you're sending the gift to. Instead of paying full price for a bottle that they may or may not like, Scentbird allows your friends and family to choose whatever they want for a fraction of the price. Don't pay $150 to $300. And the products keep coming month after month. What I like about Scentbird is you get to pick a new fragrance each month from over 600 brands. That is a lot. So Scentbird has a simple quiz to narrow down the right fit for you and what you love. Scentbird has brands like Prada, Gucci, Versace, and so much more. I've been enjoying Scentbird for so long. This isn't the first time I've worked with Scentbird and I hope it's not the last because I truly love their product. Here's what the vial looks like. It just, you just twist it up and then you get this gorgeous, perfect mist. It's every time is just the perfect amount. It's larger than your typical small sample size, but they're, they're small enough to be able to just throw into your purse. They are said to last 30 days, but I get, I get more days out of it typically than just 30. They come with a little card that tells you, that gives you the information about the fragrance, the notes, ingredients, and things like that. This card also has a picture of the bottle so that if you did decide you wanna go buy a bigger one, you know what it looks like. I went back to my sweeter scents this month. I did the last time I had more earth tones, but this, I went kind of back to my sweeter scents. This one is my all time favorite and that's Pink Sugar. It is so sweet and, and, and that's the scents that I, that I love. And it has bergamot, uli, cotton candy, strawberry, and vanilla. I mean, it just doesn't get much sweeter than that. But it smells good and it lasts all day long. It's always been my favorite. And then uh, a couple of other ones that I got. It's called Dime Seven Summers. This one is also a sweeter uh, but it's it's sweet and clean at the same time. It smells amazing. And then the last one here is Delina. Perfumes by Marley. Mmm. Uh, they all smell great. They're vials. They have different colors that you can get. Very beautiful. Don't pay full price for a bottle of perfume. Subscribe to Scentbird today. If you would like to try out Scentbird, I have a code for you guys. Here it is on the screen as well. I'll leave it in the description box. Scentbird just expanded to Canada. So if you are in Canada, you now can enjoy Scentbird as well. Very cool. Why not treat yourself today with Scentbird? You can get a decent amount of high-end fragrance that doesn't break the bank. And with my code, it will be even more affordable. Make sure you use my code KFLOWER55 for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Thanks so much to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video and thanks to you guys for listening. So before we go 
any further, I'd like to do a quick warning. We are going to be talking about another crimey child case. If you are sensitive to said topic, I will see you in the next one. Portia's case is another one of those where we can already start to see problems before she was even born. Portia's mother, Tiffany Bennett, had already been on and off human services supervision from way back. In 1994, her eldest daughter was brought into the intensive care unit to be treated for shaken baby syndrome. Of course, shaken baby syndrome is when a baby or toddler is shaken so badly that they end up with brain injuries. It later came out that it was actually the babysitter who had hurt her daughter, but Tiffany and her husband, Oliver Bynum Jr., were deemed perpetrators by omission by the DHS, and her daughter was removed from the home. In 1997, the DHS confirmed that Tiffany was a serious drug abuser and petitioned to have her children removed from the home because she couldn't provide them. She couldn't provide them with a sustainable, stable living conditions, and she was refusing to follow the advice given to her by social services to try to change that. Her girls weren't actually removed from the home, but social services was ordered to keep them under close supervision. In 1998, one of her daughters was temporarily taken into foster care because Tiffany got kicked out of the shelter that she was living in. Tiffany was ordered to go through several mental health checks and to follow social workers' advice, and she agreed. She moved into the Salvation Army shelter where she gave birth to another daughter. But she left that shelter in 1999, taking two of her daughters with her. Just a little over a year later, in the year 2000, little Portia Bennett was born into all of this mess. Portia was born on July 7th in 2000, and she was just about two years old when her mother decided to send her to live with her aunt, Candace Geiger and her boyfriend Jerry Chambers. The girls moved in in 2002 and Tiffany paid Candace and Jerry 50 to 80 dollars a week to look after her four daughters. We don't know why Tiffany made this decision but it's not so hard to imagine that the reasons behind it we can see just this pattern of unstable behavior going on back uh, dating back years and years we also kn know that their grandfather Oliver Bynum senior was actually the main caregiver for the oldest who was only 10 at the time but he was suddenly been contacted by Tiffany and told that he was not allowed to see her daughter anymore she even sent a note to the school to make sure that the teachers wouldn't hand their daughter over to him if he came to pick her up from school. We also know he tried to regain custody, but couldn't. So not sure what that's all about. So we'll just move on. Their surviving children say that life was actually pretty good when they first moved in with Candace and Jerry, but that things took a turn around July 4th, 2003. We don't really know what caused the shift to happen. We just know that it did, and these girls were put through hell while they lived with Candace and Jerry. They were beaten with broom handles, belts, extension cords. Another time, one of the girls was forced to eat dog feces and locked in the basement with two big dogs. Candace would later testify in court that... They would only beat the children when they were being naughty. She described it. It wasn't every day, but, you know, maybe every other day. For some reason, I just have a hard time believing that. And it gets even harder because we know that these girls were also essayed. Portia's six-year-old sister told the court how Jerry had touched her while she was laying in bed, and he'd made her touch him, the eldest who remember who you remember was only 10 at the time, told them how Jerry had assayed her and that she couldn't do anything about it. The only thing she was able to do was get angry. 
The defense would later argue in court that there was no evidence to prove that Jerry had actually done this to the 10-year-old because she hadn't gone into a doctor's office or told a teacher or a school nurse, nothing. I don't even really know what to make of that. It's so hard for so many survivors to report their abuse, let alone a child who'd been reporting someone's someone who's supposed to be taking care of her and the eldest seems to be a really big target for Jerry. We know that in August of 2003 a woman called CPS to make a complaint about the 10 year old with severe bruising on her face. We actually have quotes from the report. She said quote he beats those kids like they are men. His hands are swollen from hitting them. He makes them stay in the house all the time, unquote. She said she'd never seen or heard the girls actually being beat, but she'd recently been to the house and the eldest came to the door and her eyes were swollen. A social worker was sent out to Candace and Jerry's home, but it was really late at night. I don't know why social workers do this, and no one answered the door. I don't know what I would have done in this situation, but I wouldn't just leave a note at the door and leave. That's what he did. And what's even more tragic is the very next day on August 17, 2003, Portia walked in on Candace and Jerry having relations. She apparently just stood there. I mean, she was only three. How was she even supposed to know what was going on or what she was seeing? But Jerry freaked out. He thought she was spying on them and he threw her into a radiator. At this time, Portia weighed 20 pounds, half what she had weighed going into the home. When the first responders got to the home, they found Portia in the back room of a filthy old house. They found her wedged between a mattress and the radiator. She'd been starved, beaten, whipped with a belt and an extension cord and smothered. One of her sisters described what happened that night. She said that Portia first got a beating from Jerry with an extension cord. The beating was so bad that Portia couldn't lie down to go to sleep. Then he hit her again for making noise. Then he picked her up and slammed her into the floor. He told her she had to stand in the corner all night, but she couldn't because she was so badly injured. And so when she wasn't able to do that, then he choked and kicked her. Just a, just a reminder, this little girl is three, three years old. The sister didn't know what happened after that because the rest of the children were sent to bed. But when they woke up in the morning, they found Portia stuck between the radiator and a mattress and they couldn't wake her up. The autopsy reported Portia's cause of death as multiple blunt force trauma, asphyxiation, and inanition. Inanition, for those that don't know, is when someone gets exhausted because of malnourishment. This is a very classic sign of child abuse, and trained professionals would recognize it right away. It also, unfortunately, means that even if Portia was given food, her body was literally too stressed to digest it properly. She was literally starving to death on top of everything else that was happening to her. Her liver was lacerated. She had multiple blunt force trauma injuries to the head, chest, abdomen, back, and arms and legs, and she was covered in old scars and marks and different stages of healing from earlier abuse. All four of the girls were actually hit regularly and incredibly malnourished. The eldest, I was, I just want to point out here that the names were never actually released to the press. And I think that's a good thing. Hopefully, they'll be able to put this all behind them and live the best lives that they can. Well, she still had those bruises on her face and the complaint had been made about the, you know, the day before, in fact. She actually looked even worse. She was black and blue so badly that her eyes were steel sealed shut and her forehead was swollen. She had a fractured eye socket and cuts on the back, on her back from when 
she had been whipped as well as scars on her butt. And doctors documented her condition, which will actually come back to play an important role later on, so remember that. Jerry and Candace, as a reminder, Can Candace is the girl's aunt and Jerry is her boyfriend, were arrested and Jerry was charged with first degree murder. And I mean, this case seems pretty clean cut. I mean, right? But in court, Jerry's lawyers argued that the charges would be changed to murder in the third degree because, wait for it, just because you guys are going to love this one. Jerry was on the white substance. It makes perfect sense, right? Because that's what everybody does. Jerry was high. He didn't actually know what he was doing. So he can't, he couldn't have meant to kill Portia that night. Therefore, it wasn't first degree. Pretty hard to argue with that, right? Mm. Thankfully, the jury disagreed. In May of 2005, they found him guilty of first degree. Also, child essay, aggravated assault because of the state of the 10-year-old, um, conspiracy and endangering child welfare, and indecent exposure, and corruption of minors. Jerry apparently didn't say much in court. He kept his head down and wouldn't even look at the jury as they read out the verdict, but apparently by the end, he had to wipe a little tear away. Poor Jerry just kidding, burn in hell. He later came out to say that he suffered from bipolar disorder and he is he's diagnosed as having schizoaffective bipolar type disorder, but that didn't change the outcome in court. He was sentenced to 73 to 146 years for what he did to the surviving girls and the death of Portia. The judge said that Portia's sisters would never be able to truly recover from everything Jerry had done to them. And I think that's just the, the part that breaks my heart the most. Uh, I mean, they survived. I just hope that they can move on from everything that happened. Candace was convicted of third degree murder and endangering the welfare of children. This came with a possible 48 to 96 years in prison for her part of the abuse towards the children. There are conflicting reports about how much she actually was involved. Some people say that she helped Jerry. Some people say that she was also a victim. Who knows for sure? But for me, she may not have done everything that Jerry did to those girls, but I personally blame her so much more for standing around and doing nothing, if that's even the case. I, I can't say for sure, but she was one of the main reasons Jerry was even in their lives. She was the reason he's in the house and had access to the girls to begin with. Without her dating him, there would be no Jerry. I just wish that she had done something, anything to get the girls out of there and stand by her nieces. But unfortunately for everyone, it's just too late for her to do anything now. That being said, her relationship was G with Jerry was more than a little sticky. She was only about 17 when all of this was happening, and she'd been involved with Jerry since the age of 15. Jerry was almost 30 when they got together. In her mugshot, she actually has two black eyes and looks like she's been beaten up as well. We also know that she's been in foster care growing up, at least from some time to another, because her own parents were busy abusing drugs. Either way, it doesn't paint a pretty picture of what her own life looked like. She told the judge in court that she was sorry about what happened to Portia and that she still thinks about her every day. She said, I wish that she was still here. I would tell her I love her and I am sorry and it wasn't her fault what happened. She also said that she wanted to apologize to her other nieces and that she would when she got out of prison. But the judge made it very, very clear that she was not supposed to have any contact with them. She ultimately was sentenced to 17 to 34 years in prison and, and told her, I do not want you to contact your nieces. Your nieces are not recovering at the rate that I prayed they would.
I truly hope they have now. But coming back around to where this all started, Tiffany the mom was also taken to court. She tried to make bail at first, but her right was revoked. And when this happened, Tiffany said, someone else killed my baby and I got jammed for it. It, it, it. And that's so funny. She says it herself, but she doesn't quite get it. Yes, Tiffany, she is your baby. You should have been there for her. There's even a ridiculous story from her bail hearing. Apparently, one of Tiffany's friends threw herself down on the floor when the judge denied Tiffany bail. She slid down off her seat and started screaming and kicking at the carpet like a two-year-old. She wouldn't leave. She wouldn't leave the courtroom even when the court was empty. And the security had to come and get her and carry her out of the building. Like, I don't really know what she was trying to achieve with all that. Maybe if I kick and scream, they're going to grant her bail? What? But I doubt she got what she wanted, and, uh, and we know she didn't. In Tiffany's trial, her defense argued that Tiffany's only mistake was trusting her sister to look after her children. They said that she had been around and that she checked in on them every day and never once saw that anything was wrong. The judge disagreed. He said that there was no way anybody could look at those children and not see something was truly terribly wrong in this situation. He even cited the fact that Portia had lost more than half her body weight in the time she'd spent living there and she should have been a, that should have been a sign to anyone, let alone her own mother, that something was really wrong. And then the judge convicted Tiffany on four counts of felony conspiracy and endangering the welfare of children and sentenced her to 20 to 40 years in prison, which is a harsher sentence than Candace got. She might have actually gotten away with with less, but just around this same time, one of the girls ran away from their foster home and tried to take her own life. It's another tragic part of this story, but it really helped seal the deal for Tiffany. I think it is also shows how deeply affected these girls were by everything that happened to them, and I just hope that they're in a better place now. I keep saying that because I really, really hope that they're getting therapy and they're healing and healthy. Anyways, the trial went on for four weeks and during that time, the family of the four girls never showed up, not even once no family support whatsoever. The prosecution pointed that out and they said, these, quote, these three girls, with the exception of their new foster parents, had the same support of blood relatives as they had before August 17th. None, zero, unquote. And I just think that's so true. I'm surprised that not even that grandfather that was trying to take care of the oldest didn't show up. I mean, what does that say? There is also conflicting reports on how much the rest of the family actually knew about the abuse. Again, that grandfather, Oliver Bynum Sr., said that he had no idea what was happening, but cousins and nephews testified that he had actually been there on several occasions when the girls were being hit on. A part of me wants to say that that couldn't be true, and no one would just sit by and watch their grandchildren getting hurt, but a part of me also sees that no one bothered to show up for them in court. So another really, really crazy part about this case is that Jerry's twin brother had just been convicted for essaying his 11-year-old granddaughter and assaulting another 14-year-old child. The apple does not fall far from the tree in this family, but what's crazy is that same guy, not only was he a regular over at Jerry's house, he was often the babysitter for the girls. Forget Child Protective Services, why would any of the family let the children be around him? 
there's no official report on whether DHS actually knew that Jerry's brother was in the home before Portia died, but we do know that they cited as a reason why it was unsuitable for Tiffany to regain custody of her surviving children so they could see that it was a bad idea for the girls to be in the same home as him. So you would have thought they would at least check in on them, especially because Jerry's brother was looking after children that he wasn't even related to. And I would have thought that they would take a complaint about child abuse in a home where there's already a connection to essaying children a little bit more seriously than just leaving a note on the door in the middle of the night. I would say why and just leave it at that, but it gets worse. The DHS launched an investigation into the handling of the complaint made against Candace in Jerry's home. At first, everything seemed to be done according to the standard procedures, including just leaving a note telling the family that there was an open case to get in touch with DHS. But the department changed its statement when they read the, the official police report. See, to quote his exact words, the social worker said that he had left a note on the metal gate outside the house. He, his name is Joe Maiden, Maiden said that he'd gone there late at night. He said the gate was locked and there didn't seem to be anyone awake in the house. So he left a note on the gate and made plans to come back. But the Official police report said that they didn't find any note and there wasn't even a metal gate outside the house. In the next month, the department instituted several disciplinary actions against Maiden, accusing him of lying and falsifying records. He quickly retired before they could discipline him properly and refused to speak to the press about the charges uh, or the case. But he did come out later to say he thought he was a scapegoat. He even said he'd never checked to see if the gate was locked and just because the police didn't find his note didn't mean that he never went out there. However, when the judge looked at all the evidence, he said that Maiden had clearly made no attempts to go out to the home or follow up on the complaint left on the hotline. Funnier enough, Maiden didn't fight to change the record than either, and neither did DHS. What also makes his position so difficult to defend is that Joe Maiden actually asked to be on this case. The complaint against Candace and Jerry was actually going to be handled by a different social worker, and Maiden asked if he could take it instead, and then he didn't even go out there? Who knows if Maiden hadn't asked to be on the case, maybe Portia would still be alive right now. It's not even just that. He could have been honest with his supervisors and said he hadn't been out there and, and that they could have possibly sent someone else. Social workers are busy. We all know that. If he'd just been honest, there's a chance that this could have stopped in time. And it gets even stickier for the D for DHS. It turns out that they had hired Maiden after he'd already been fired from the city's Department of Human Relations. They'd also only given him two months on the job training before he was on his own handling his own cases. They said he felt competent enough and they needed to let him get to work. It also later came out that DHS had internally come to the official conclusion that Maiden had never actually gone out to the home, but had never made an official statement or released to the press because, quote, no one had asked. It really just seemed like they didn't want to take responsibility for failing Portia or even just the mistakes they made by putting an under qualified social worker out on the cases, especially when he'd already been fired from another city job. But to circle back to Portia and just how horrible things that were done to her, I'm not exactly sure how to explain this case. It's just so hard when a child was only three years old and died for absolutely no reason. But I think the prosecution statement to Tiffany Bennett at the trial really says it all. Quote, you aren't drug addicted. You aren't alcohol dependent. You are simply selfish. You're 
excuses are offensive. You failed your children in a way that is almost incomprehensible. It's true, unquote. It, it, it's true. A parent has the main responsibility to look after their children, even if they're, if they're sent to live with relatives or anyone else. This was an extremely sad case. Part of me wanted to give credit to Tiffany that she couldn't take care of her girls and she passed them along to her sister, but her sister was 17 years old and had no business taking on four children. You guys let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let's leave a purple heart in the comments for Portia and our surviving sisters that I hope are healing if I haven't said that enough during this video. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop or there's a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist if you'd like to check them out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye.